This is Tom Kozik from Hilltop Securities with another podcast, this time focused on ESG, or environmental, social, and governance factors, and how that has been interacting and impacting investing in the municipal bond market. Uh, today, we're joined by Ksenia Coban. She's a senior VP and municipal strategist at Payton and Regal. Ksenia oversees municipal credit research there. She's responsible for the integration of credit into the portfolios of the firm's $4 billion of tax advantage accounts. She is also a co-chair of the firm's ESG committee and works on the development and implementation of municipal social impact and broad ESG investment strategies and solutions for the firm's global investor base. Let me, before we get started, let me say a few things about uh, Payton & Regal. Payton is one of the largest privately owned global investment advisors in the world. It has $140 billion of assets under management, founded in 1983 by Joan Payton. The firm is a leader in the active management of fixed income and equity portfolios, headquartered in Los Angeles, with offices in Boston, London, and Milan. And the client base includes institutional and individual investors. And Payton's really been able to distinguish itself through uh, portfolio customization, and that's one of the things that Ksenia has been helping with. Ksenia, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Tom. I'm uh, more than honored to be here. This is my inaugural podcast recording, so I'm really happy to be doing it with you and really looking forward to the topic that we'll be discussing today. Well, I know that I've been talking about this topic. You're actually one of the individuals who I've been talking about this topic with for the longest period of time. Uh, and I mean that not just in the number of months, but in the number of years. And I was wondering if you could start out by talking about how you began working on ESG themes as it relates to credit uh, at your firm. But And also if you could talk a little bit about how it, this topic evolves as being important at Payton. Um, okay, well, so let's maybe start with how did Payton get involved um, mm -hmm. in ESG integration and reporting, and then um, I'll build on where I came onto the scene some years later. Um, well, right. Payton got involved in uh, ESG and thematic investing and generally responsible investment practices in 2013 when we became a signatory to the Principles for Responsible Investment, which is the PRI, it's a uh, global organization for setting some responsible investment principles and then being transparent uh, about your practices, investment strategies, and uh, you know, sort of the future. How do you see this playing out in your portfolios and operations? So we've been reporting to the PRI since 2013. And last year, um, I'll take the opportunity to just note our, we were um, distinguished as one of very few, maybe a handful of US side managers that were uh, that were included on the leaders group for reporting around climate change and climate related metrics for the PRI. So that was a great distinction. We were very proud of it last year. Um, so it was really nice mm -hmm. culmination of the several years we've spent engaging with the organization. So that's how the journey began for us, and it uh, it is still a journey, uh, and it will be a journey for um, for us and our peers and our clients. I came on the scene um, of our internal practices, ESG practices, when I started thinking about, obviously, the municipal market is near and dear to my heart. This is where I spent my entire career, and uh, I still oversee credit today uh, on, our, on our tax advantage strategy. And, of course, we were, you know, sort of starting to think of uh, how do municipals fit into the sustainability discourse? And, of course, the, you know, the, the number of connections and uh, alignment of uh, municipal bonds and the kind of entities that issue them with sustainability goals and priorities became very clear very early on to me. So um, I think in 2017, um, sometime, some years ago now, it feels like, feels like a decade, but I started thinking about how do we think about munis? right, from a sustainability or impact investment um, lens. And uh, that's when we started exploring a social impact framework and strategy at the firm. And we launched our first uh, labeled or sort of designated social impact product in early 2020 with our uh, California Social Impact Fund, which is a tax-advantaged fund 
um, that we run out of Los Angeles. And we spent several years uh, thinking about the social impact framework and strategy in that fund. Uh, obviously doing a lot of due diligence and doing a lot of um, um, systematized thinking. Of how do we look at the muni market through some consistent set of principles? And uh, and then, you know, and transitioned the funds holdings over about a year and a half or two years. And we, when we were ready and set up with our ideas and uh, for how to do social impact with munis, we launched the fund in 2020. And so has it been a, uh, a, a difficult uh, either transition and or area to incorporate into the investing strategy in municipals? Has it, is it something that uh, municipals naturally, because uh, I guess in my mind, it seems as though almost everything that happens in the municipal bond market should be related to either one or multiple variables within ESG. Has it been a, uh, have you had a, a difficult time or has it been easy to kind of create the buckets? Well, it's been a bit of both at different times. So I think, you know, the ideation around social impact with munis was fairly easy because you have what exactly what you just mentioned, right? A lot of the use of proceeds and the kind of entities we're looking at align really well with global consensus principles on what is sustainable uh, and environmentally and socially sustainable investing. We, we early on chose the ICMA principles, the International Capital Markets Association principles, the green social and sustainability bond project categories, which when we you know, spend some time with what they were and the various other requirements of um, the ICMA bond designation, we saw, wow, munis fit really well. A lot of munis fit really well into this framework. So let's see how we can make it work in a registered, you know, open-ended product. And so that was sort of the ideation of social impact framework into, uh, you know, vehicle we already had on the market. Now, the difficult part was sort of the, the other side of the responsible investment spectrum. So if we're, if we're going from thematic investing and sustainability focused investing on one side, which munis do really, really well around, you know, things like uh, sustainable development goals or the ICMA principles, like I mentioned, on the other hand is the, you know, the more traditional or the broadly uh, discuss topic of ESG risk integration, right? Is understanding environmental, social, and governance risks uh, in the various investments that we make, uh, being able to uh, assess them, integrate them into your process, and be able to um, derive financial performance outcomes of the of the instruments as a result of these risks, right? What is how material are they to financial performance of the issuer, and um, to what extent do we think it'll impact the uh, the investment's performance in the market? That is where I think munis pose a unique set of challenges for investors. Right, the ESG integration piece is difficult because, uh, well, for for a number of reasons. Because I think the questions we ask around ESG materiality, like what is material to financial uh, performance of an issuer from an environmental, social, and governance point of view, um, that, that question doesn't really work for munis in many cases, or certainly not many sectors in munis, because many municipal issuers do not actually um, cause any negative externalities to society. In fact, their mission is to mitigate them, right? Um, and to be able to uh, serve communities in a way that helps um, mitigate the negative externalities of for-profit activities, and then also obviously take care and provide uh, services and infrastructure to the communities that the entity serves. So a lot of these questions don't really work well for Muni. So there wasn't a lot of data uh, for us to work with on the municipal side that was easily packaged, that, uh, you know, had these nice, you know, uh, convenient buckets of environmental, social, and governance metrics, um, had, you know, decent sector coverage or deep enough insight for us to make that data decision useful. So the data limitations really made part of that exercise difficult, but um, but certainly the, the idea around being an impact investor with municipal bonds, that was, uh, you know, that was the easy part. And it's, I mean, how should, 
how should we be thinking about ESG? Because this is, as you were describing, I mean, the ESG factors and our risks have been, have always existed. I mean, climate change related, weather related. Uh, I mean, these things have always existed. It, uh, is How is it that in the investor community and or the issuer community should be thinking about this? Should, be think, should be, they be thinking about it as though we're in the early stages of something brand new? Or is it something that is more, uh, as you were kind of alluding to, more data, is the situation and how it, and the change and the potential change in thinking, is it more data driven? How should we be thinking about it? Yeah, I think that's a really good question because, like I said, you know, municipals have a slightly different mandate around all of this and certainly, uh, you know, very differing set of vulnerabilities to these risks. So for mm -hmm. munis, I think the question to be asking, um, and this is, you know, in a broader sense, as far as, you know, global corporates, let's say in sovereigns and so on, those questions are being asked in, in those forums as well, but it sort of, what is the impact of, let's say, change in climate or um, changing socioeconomic patterns, uh, demographics, um, you know, questions around policy risk at the local, global level and so on? How do these risks, and we can bucket them into E, S, and G, uh, according to, you know, either standards we set as, a, as an industry or you know through proprietary frameworks but we ask the question is how do these risks or to what extent do we think these risks will impact financial performance of munis over a specific time horizon of municipal entities and what is being done to mitigate that impact by these entities right or by uh by states or uh let's say by you know public enterprises so the questions you know then are not only on what are these risks and do they do we think that they will lead to um you know deteriorating financial outcomes or maybe they create opportunities and then the following question is what are the governance practices around these um for state and local governments uh, and public enterprises so that's kind of how we think about it in munis uh which is slightly different it's a slightly different lens than the way you would think about it in corporates especially uh corporate sectors like you know carbon intensive sectors where you're thinking about you know oil and gas extractive industries metals and mining consumer staples and so on um so that's how we think about it in munis and obviously once you've asked the right questions and you you know you've figured out a process for identifying and assessing these risks then comes the question of integration you know where's the data uh, how, you know, uh, so, yeah. So, so you're, so you're, yeah, so you're now talking, so you're now talking about, and you just mentioned some of the physical risks, right? Uh -huh. The physical risks as it relates to maybe climate change or weather. And, and now you're kind of transitioning or moving over into how it is that from a data perspective, uh, and the investor or issuer community can look at those physical risks, right? Yeah, physical risks um, okay. are a key concern, right? Um, and we can talk about the 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 uh, out of physical risks obviously come transition risks. So if we set decarbonization of the economy as an objective, what are the transition risks about that? Transition risks that come out of that. But if we focus on physical risks, just on mm. you know risks that a changing climate may pose to state and local government uh, revenue bases. You know, that's where we start to really want a lot of good data um, mm -hmm. and consistent data and normalized data that, you know, controls for sizes of entities that are issuing bonds. And, you know, are you looking at a state size entity or are you looking at a local water district? Right. So you have to have data that makes sense in the context of the issuers in which you're trying to integrate it for. Um, so the physical risks are really interesting because obviously um you know it, it's not a new discipline right i mean if you think about who has been assessing physical risks and who's really good at it is the insurance industry um and they you know they've been doing physical risk assessment for as long as there's been insurance in the world which is forever um so mm -hmm. there are models for this right uh we do understand that there's certain you know we've modeled weather and climate patterns and we've linked them to um risks to physical assets and even uh 
risks to financial performance of these physical assets and you know underlying entities. So it's not like the models are not there. We just have to do a lot of translating and a lot of mapping of this data to municipal entities so that it becomes decision useful to policymakers, issuers, um, you know, and investors. And so then what about some of the more uh, qualitative risks? Uh, what are the more qualitative risks that uh, the investor and the issuer community should be thinking about? I'm thinking of things like uh, mm -hmm. social justice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, metrics and indicators that, like you said, we've probably been thinking about for a really long time. We just didn't put them in the social risk bucket or the governance risk bucket, right? Even if you can quantify them, uh, you know, we want to say that the risk is qualitative in the sense that, um, you know, that we think that a certain type of a metric like income inequality, let's say, right, or, um, uh, gender pay gap inequity, we think on a qualitative basis that that may pose risks to the institution, right? As well as governance. Mm -hmm. Governance is entirely qualitative, let's say. But even if you can quantify the metric, you're always trying to ask the question of what is it that I'm trying to measure and why do I think it's important? Um, and it isn't just a set of, you know, top-down in fact, munis still benefit from the fact that there isn't a set of top-down materiality frameworks and metrics that are being handed down to us by some sort of a, you know, a sovereign regulatory body like what is happening in Europe. You know, we're still a ways ahead from that in the U.S., but it doesn't mean that these risks shouldn't be thought of uh, today and shouldn't be, you know, um, quantified to some sense and then compared between issuers and the, you know, the within peer issuers and then within sectors. So um, social risks are some of the things that, you know, we've obviously encountered a lot in the last uh, 18 months that relate to um, health and safety of a population, right? Um, so that could be a pandemic, it could be a natural disaster, it can be any number of things, right? Health and safety. So are, um, you, mm -hmm. so, so are you alluding to the fact that by saying that there aren't specific criteria that are being kind of pushed down to the state local government level that it's you're almost implying that uh, the state local government state local governments themselves actually have an opportunity uh, or have the opportunity and could control through reinforcing and or new and or changing policies in order to improve situations that the data is telling them they maybe need to consider bingo yeah exactly Okay. Uh, that you know, because if you if you think about what's sort of out there in the ecosystem of ESG investing and impact investing, what you will probably see a lot of headlines on are these third party issued ESG scores, right? And ESG ratings that are being provided by third party providers and that are looking at all of these various there's you know endless number of metrics of environmental social and governance and various data points. And these ratings and these scores are based on a few things, right? Like the methodology is not just what is the metric and how material do we think it is to your financial performance. The second uh, heaviest weighted component of an ESG score rating is what are you doing about it? How are you trying to control uh, for what that, what that particular risk may portend for your balance sheet? may uh you know how it may impact your access to capital markets and the cost of capital so the the question of governance around esg risks is really important not just in you know in munis today where there isn't a lot of top-down materiality frameworks and metrics being pushed down on us but um you know but as we move forward and as investors start to ask these questions either in a collaborative in a collaborative fashion uh uh, through, you know, various engagement uh, initiatives and so on. But also the policymakers themselves have to understand these risks in order to be able to govern effectively, right? In order to continue to provide services at the extent and, you know, to the depth and breadth that, that they were providing them before at, you know, and expect a certain cost of capital as, a, you know, a, as they go on about their business. Because, you know, whether you think these risks are actually material or not to credit today for municipalities, 
uh, and many will argue that they're not because, you know, municipal entities, especially things like states, have a lot of levers to pull to mitigate any one uh, or even a number of E, S, or G risks. So, you know, not mm -hmm. much is material to the balance sheet. We start to think about, um, you know, how the momentum behind this is building, right? And so mindsets are changing. Uh, among the investor community and then the broader stakeholder community like that's the really big part of all of this that I think gets does not get enough attention is that this isn't really coming from investors right <laughs> if we're buy side asset managers or asset owners or anything like that uh, they're certainly not coming from the issuers themselves in terms of like here please assess us on a basis of you know a number of new risks we've never heard of it's really coming from the stakeholders uh, the stakeholders themselves, you know, which include for munis, of course, it's constituents, right? It's property tax payers, it's income tax payers, it's people who receive and benefit from services, who provide the services in the community. These are all the stakeholders that are driving the momentum behind all of this. And we, for our part, are, are working really hard to provide solutions. Um, but it is certainly not, you know, our mandate to do this. It's really in response to increased sentiments uh, and increase awareness that, uh, you know, the capital markets should think about risks other than just traditional financial risks. And where is it that, where are the best sources of data or the most informative sources of data for this type of uh, to, to in order to look at these types of risks because on, on the one hand I'd go back to kind of the end of 2019 being beginning of 2020 right before COVID hit I know from in in my experience at the beginning of 2020 is really when for example the radiant she's really started to go uh, put a, a ton of effort into this and I know that they were even before that but I go back to a presentation that I was part of at the beginning of 2020 with members of each of the Radiant Chiefs, and I was just surprised that, I don't know, 90% of the conversation that each of the members of the Radiant Chiefs was really focused on was ESG. Mm -hmm. um, uh, now, now that we're a year, you know, a year and a half after, um, it's it seems as though there are data providers out there with maps and numbers that are that are uh, showing what the physical risks are maybe maybe alluding to some of what the more uh, some of some of you know some of the income the the topics that are related to in, income and inequality and some of those but what how is it that investors and the issuer community can really sift through this is this something that they have to do with someone like you somebody who has I've been looking at this for several years, or is there data and or sources that others are going to be able to, to, to look at themselves? Well, I'm really happy you asked this question because I always um, want to, every time I engage in this topic with the broader community, is I really want to be helpful in providing sources. Is Where do you go to learn about this? Mm -hmm. Where do you go to engage with this? Where do you get help <laughs> in understanding and right. you know how this all fits into your governance plans? And... Uh, one of the first, for municipals, one of the first place I turn folks to is uh, the CDP, which is the Carbon Disclosure Project. Uh, it used to go up by the Carbon mm -hmm. Disclosure Project, now it's just the CDP. And that is a nonprofit mm -hmm. entity that has been collecting um, climate related information. And this is specifically for environmental risks, climate related information from uh, entities all over the world corporate, governmental, quasi governmental, local government. Uh, for 30 years, and they really have uh, focused on understanding climate risks from uh, uh, rising temperatures to deforestation to water stress and so on. Out of the and their, web, and their website is it's cdp.net, cdp right? Cdp.net, right? And cdp.net, right. and as this organization is growing and becoming um, really one of um, you know the mainstays of climate-related disclosure. It's doing things like targeting specific sectors around the world, right? Like CDP launched a CDP cities uh, division where they're really going to be focusing on U.S. cities and municipal entities, helping them understand these risks, helping them disclose what they know 
but not just disclose to them, offer a lot of guidance, a lot of uh, connectivity, but really about, you know, sort of networking uh, their partners amongst themselves and matching those who really need information and, re and need guidance with public resources that are available or private resources are available and, you know, sort of creating really fruitful public-private partnerships. And then recently, um, one of my favorite sources of information and sort of data sets on climate change has been uh, an organization, little known, I think, entity until very recently called climatechange.ai. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is a consortium of academics, actually, and machine learning and AI specialists that have really sat down and, uh, and thought like, hey, you know, our skill set and what we do uh, in terms of understanding how computer systems, machine learning, and so on can, you know, how we can leverage this tremendous uh, tool for being able to better understand the risks and obviously uh, offer a lot more predictability of, of, um, of these models to anybody who asks. And this is a public resource and they have uh, a page called resources and they basically, you know, give tools for uh, cities, local governments, you know, planners, uh, transportation, electric systems, buildings and cities and so on. So they have a tremendous set of resources available uh, there as well. But, you know, this is just two of many that exist um, that are even sector specific ones. You know, in fact, they have a, have a whole list of these somewhere. But there's sector specific mm -hmm. ones. That's, you know, if you're an entity in the transportation sector, right, or mass transit or housing, uh, there's a set of sustainability principles you know, uh, it could be, you know, it can go to depths such as like engineering uh, approaches and how do you engineer a transit oriented development project? Um, what are some of the, you know, technologies and um, inputs that you should prioritize? So there's quite a lot out there at the moment uh, for munis if they are looking for it. The question is, do they know to look for it? And that is why we do quite a bit of, uh, we're trying to do quite a bit of direct engagement with issuers on this topic. And then we take every opportunity for collaborative engagement on this um, as well. Well, it sounds like to me, you just gave us the topic for our next discussion where I think that you should come back and we'll talk about some more of those specific sources uh, as it relates to some of the sectors and municipals. Uh, mm -hmm. And I hope that our listeners will uh, take a look at uh, the uh, the uh, CDP.net and climatechange.ai in the meantime. Uh, but for now, I want to say uh, thank you for joining us today. I appreciate this. This has been a great discussion. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll have you come back uh, very soon so we can start to talk about some more uh, of the specific data that's available, because I think that there are going to be a lot of folks who are going to be interested to uh, look at that and or uh, talk to professionals in the business about what it is that uh, is listed in those sources. So uh, I'm Tom Koslick from Hilltop Securities. Thank you for joining us today, and we look forward to having you come back and listen to our next podcast. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's my pleasure.